My name is Will Powell, and I'm a former professional football player turned world traveler and entrepreneur. All of us are called to be great. Maybe we just need a little inspiration or direction, but most importantly, we need the willpower to follow through so we can stop dreaming and start doing. Hey guys, we're in the United Kingdom in London. We just had the Podium Breakthrough Series at the University of Hertfordshire yesterday. And I have my good friend, camp manager of the event, Fab Garjulo here. Hey, Will. Local, local of the, uh, correct me, how do you say Hertford, Hertfordshire? Hart. Hart. Hertfordshire. Hertf Hertfordshire. And uh, this is my guy. He is a member of the Great Britain uh, national team, uh, veteran for the, the, the London Blitz for many, many years. And uh, he's also in medical sales, right? Yeah, yeah, I work in uh, orthopedics. Orthopedics. Yeah. All right, so Fab, let's, let's just rewind back several years. How did you find American football in the UK? Uh, at the University of Hertfordshire. So okay. uh, I came there as a, as a student at 18, um, having uh, grown up in a, a normal school, basically playing all the normal sports. And um, yeah, I found American football. I, I liked it on the TV and had a, a general interest in it. Mm -hmm. Found the team, loved the, the ethos that the team had in terms of professionalism and the work ethic. Um, and yeah, made it into the team in the first year and just sort of progressed, <coughs> progressed from there, really. Mind you, several years later, this is a guy that just got back from the United States, traveling across California, UCLA, a bunch of high schools, and got the full experience. So this guy is fully integrated into the American football world. Now, let's go talk about the university system. I think a lot of people in the US, for example, have no idea that there's 100, 100 plus university teams. Talk about the atmosphere of college football here. Um, so you've got uh, fairly similar, I guess, to uh, D1, D2, D3 out in, out in the States. You've got uh, some premiership, Division 1 and Division 2 in terms of the tiering. Um, the, the, the top programs are, are in the, the premiership and then the smaller programs are in the divisions below. You can get promoted. So that's a, that's a difference from compared to the college. So if you win your, div win your, your division and your, your bowl, then you can get promoted and obviously the, the premiership play for a national championship every year. Wow, wow. So, and what's the competition level like? Ever increasingly good. Good. Yeah, uh, it's a very healthy league in terms of the, the athletes that it's producing. You know, it's fortunate it's in a situation where it's picking up guys that are in there on the, on the sort of the, the bottom of their athletic peak um, and have an opportunity over those three, four years that they're at university to to hit their athletic peak. It's a sport that demands a lot of athleticism. Um, and no surprise, the best programs, you know, they run the gym sessions, they run um, a well-organized practice, they run, you know, player education alongside uh, just pure football. And, and then they end up with the best players filtering out into the, either the senior teams or, uh, or the national program. Well, and, and, and touch on that more in the sense of these guys who come to the university in the US you've got kids who have played since the age of eight mm -hmm. who are prepping their entire lives to get a college football scholarship whereas here in, the, here in the UK a lot of the time these college coaches are having these kids play football for the first time right yeah so yeah. what's what's that like well that was me you know I was green as they come like I didn't understand it uh, I was totally lost my first year running around trying to understand all the X's and O's as well as uh, all the names for things and how I should be doing things. Um, yeah, it's totally, it's totally different. Uh, so the coaching, you have to start small. You can't go in with all the, the common language that there is associated with American football. Sometimes you have to break it down. But the demand for learning is really high. Mm -hmm. So we, I, I coach at Hertfordshire University. I'm a defensive coordinator there, and you know we run Tuesday Tuesday classroom sessions um, and pra and field practice, and then a pr full practice on the Thursday. So the classroom is that opportunity to teach um, in a in a written format, effectively, or a, you know a visual format. And obviously we're teaching out on the field in a practical format. So guys are asked to, to learn a lot quickly, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Definitely, definitely. Now mind you, as I said, Fab was the, the camp manager for us here, and we could not have executed this, this, this event without him. I mean, the University of Hertfordshire, 
beautiful facility, beautiful campus. Shout out to the Hurricanes and the, and the university in general. Uh, the classrooms were top notch. The field was top notch. And you know, Fab's over here. He's getting subway situated for the, for the, for lunch. He's he's getting the clipboards. He's getting the classroom situated. I mean, it was an excellent event. And and Fab, talk about the significance of that. Bringing in the, you know the top coaches from Germany, having having an event where these kids can come and learn and be scouted. What's the significance of that in the UK? Well, uh, if you look what we did with it was it was twofold. So we wanted to have the top coaches to be able to teach our coaches something. So we had the coaches clinic on the Friday, um, which I felt was really, really su successful um, in, in the sense that the coaches that we brought in, they didn't talk about just how great they were and what and you know what they did to, to be that good. They told us the, the why, the, the methods, um, and, and gave, gave something that I felt you know British coaches could take and apply to their, to their college programs, to their senior team programs, and the feedback you know instantly was very, very good from that. On top of that, players, you know, the, in the UK, um, we can see the European leagues very easily. You know, mm -hmm. the internet is a, is a fantastic tool to access. You know, the German league, the French league, the Austrian league, uh, all of those in Scandinavia. So there's players out there already. That, you know, you're all interconnected in terms of friendships and, and playing on the same teams in the past. So guys are, are keen to go and experience that. And mm -hmm. at the moment, Europe. Uh, in particular, you look at Germany and Finland per, per se, uh, offering British guys that, those opportunities that they're just not available here. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've talked at length over the over the course of the last couple of days about some of the situations that uh, are different, and um, yeah, the the, the talented guys are looking at it and saying, "I want to compete at the highest level." For for us British guys, it's nigh on impossible to crack the NFL. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a few guys out there that. A British born and have then gone to college or high school from the age of you know 10, 12, whatever. OC Junior is British, right? OC, yeah, he is. So there's a, a great example of someone, but he's born in the UK, lived for a few years, uh, and then but spent his football time over he in the was, States. He didn't right. pick up football at 18. Right, right. Um, you know, he, there's, there's some great guys doing a lot of work, and, and I've been. Uh, been around them in terms of seeing what they do and they're taking guys you know there's a, a young defensive end called Effie Abada who uh, I played against you know he was on the London Warriors team um, mm -hmm. and he picked up the sport like I did as, as a as a young man as an 18 19 year old uh, had the real physical talents and was given an opportunity to try and progress that really rapidly into the NFL and, and he's there now he's in uh, the practice squad for the Panthers wow. and he's the kind of person that that you know, as a as a sport, we should we we do and we should continue to highlight that the potential that, that there is over here. Right. Well, and and you know, what is your opinion on on how the NFL is actually executing growing the sport in the UK? There's eight games this year, I think, <coughs> but um, four games in the UK. Okay, four games in the UK. I apologize. There's one today, actually. Yeah, there's one today. You're not going, are you? I'm not going. I think I've I think I'm all footballed out. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah. But you know, talk about it. Are they doing a good job of growing the sport at the grassroots level here? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> no, is the answer. Mm -hmm. The NFL itself is not interested in the grassroots, in my opinion, because right. the NFL is a business. Mm -hmm. It's an entertainment business. The sport is is the product, but the the method of making money in the NFL is not based on the sport itself. It's based on selling of the sport, the advertising, the publicity, and getting people to watch it. And I believe actually over there, they're having some problems. Mm -hmm. the, people are starting to switch off from the NFL right. a little bit from, yeah. from what the media is telling them. So yeah. um, for them to, to, to worry themselves with the grassroots over here in the UK, it's, it's just so far away from the thing that they're working on at the moment. It's not to say that I don't think they should be. Yeah. You know, we we talk about the, the guys that are trying to make it in and with individual, you know, dot cases. But uh, for me, with the Jags being over here, they've made a good commitment to to London, to the UK. Uh, they've brought over their flag series, their their Super Sevens, their Jag Sevens. Um, so they they're doing some work. Mm -hmm. um, are we seeing a direct correlation to? The work they've done translating into the British game, 
and the national team. Uh, it's hard to say, it's only been a couple of years. And these type of things take, take time to really develop themselves to show product, uh, you know, results over, over a long time. Well, right, but I mean, I agree with you. I think that the NFL has such a short-term vision right now. They're just trying to fill, sta fill seats at Wembley Stadium. Whereas if, if they can go to the grassroots level, you know, put more money into this, this U7-on-7 seven seven flag football, you know, actually support the university league some way, somehow, um, that's what's going to get more fans in the seats in the future and, and build a more loyal following versus, you know, having parents that are interested in the sport of, of these kids. And they're just not doing that effectively right now. No, I mean, we were talking last night about the difference in NFL Europe being over here in, you know, 15 years ago and uh, how, sort of why that didn't keep going, why it keep working. And, and the sort of conclusion we came to was that they, you know, they, they pigeon dropped in players and created a team. There was very little local buy-in because there wasn't the local players in mm. those teams because they hadn't developed them or, or they weren't at that point to be able to play. So yeah, yeah I think totally if, if you can get local guys in the teams, be it an you know, international NFL team mm -hmm. or, or you know a European team or there needs to be something something to get the buy-in of the, of the people aside from the attraction of the lights the cameras the the hard hitting the colors the cheerleaders all of the you know the entertainment side of the NFL right so a lot of British guys a lot of British fans casual fans a casual fans are they like the entertainment of the NFL? They they find that uh, exciting, which it is. Mm -hmm. But the sports fans, that you know, the diehard sports fans, they you know, we want to see we want to see good teams over here competing. Right. You know, um, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and 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 so shifting a little bit, you know, we had. 60 to 80 guys yesterday coming competing wanting to get scouted some just wanted to improve their skills now touch on touch on the senior league here so once you get done with university in the uk there's a senior league how many teams are in that league um across the whole country yeah. i think it's about 80 odd. 80 okay yeah. so 80 you know semi-pro teams here um and and these players the best players in the uk are going to germany they're going to the going to finland they're getting scouted by these coaches across europe because the league here effectively just isn't at a high professional level now why is that you know and, and what is the effect of that on football here we uh we have a very good league here in the uk uh, i don't think it's something that should be should be bashed it's a case of participation versus performance okay uh, there's a very good article out not that long ago on um, American Football International which is a website out there and they were looking at what makes a team a, a participation team what makes a team a professional team and I would say that we have a good you know 60 teams in the UK that are participation teams mm. they're for guys that like the NFL mm -hmm. that like American football that don't uh, don't value the side of uh, or understand the side of the athleticism needed or, or have the time to do that or want to do that so those guys are in a participation league which is nothing of interest to the NFL for example right the performance guys you know really and truly they're pretty much only in the Prem and they're pretty much at three or four teams mm -hmm. and the Premier League is what he means by Prem Sorry, yeah. <laughs> not the soccer one. Yeah, <laughs> um, Premier Division. So uh, you know you've got London Warriors, who South London, um, and they they came up through the ranks, building their own team from local guys, and educating them, training them to be uh, to be national champions. Recently, the London Blitz did exactly the same before that, and the London Olympians did exactly the same before that. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a, a nucleus of good t good players. You train them up to be better. They stay together, and over a course of three, four, five years, you get the results. Yeah. Um, you look at Tama Phoenix winning this year. Um, obviously, hurts me as a, as a London Blitz player to lose to them. But um, I'm, I'm friends with some of the coaches and some of the players, so I see what what they've done. This this national championship that they won this year was the culmination of three years of work. Yeah, uh, of a change in ethos in their program. So that those three teams uh, are, are the performance teams here in the UK. 
as far as as far as I'm aware. Um, at the younger level, you've got Filton, Bristol Filton Pride. They're the performance team of um, high school of yeah high school under 19. Yeah, you know um, Birmingham Lions. They're building. They have a program that's junior, youth, flag, women's. Uh, and student. Uh, Shout out Wayne Hill, by the way. They don't. Yeah, he does a great job there. In sure, sure does, and you know he's a dedicated guy. And lo and behold, his his dedication is rewarded year on year with good teams, with great teams. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Be it at whatever level it's at, mm-hmm. you know that the women's team from Birmingham provide a lot of players to the national program, mm-hmm. and you know those girls are picking up that sport for the very first time. Right. Maybe even those skills for the very first time. Well, so. in- interestingly enough. There's more football, women's football in the UK than I feel like there's even women's football in the US. I mean, why is that? Um, it's I think it's better publicised. Sure. Uh, certainly, the numbers won't be won't be the same. Yeah. There's you know maybe three five hundred girls playing in the, in the whole country. Um, they have a good structure program. Mm-hmm. The the government funds uh, new initiatives for. For you know, activating sport in, in certain demographics. So obviously, women's sport is a is a dem- different demographic. It's it's still not as high profile as men's sport across the world. Right. So there there was some money available to not just to to give to somebody, but to develop a whole program. And Jim Messenger, you know, did a fantastic job over the past five years of from five v five, you know, flag football to coming forth uh, coming forth in the world championships last year over wow. in Canada in 11 v 11 contact mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. knocking beating beating two uh, two other European nations wow so you know why is it not there in the US um, probably just because men's sport is just that, the, the be all and end all in the world of sport yeah. really and truly so well and we had a, we had a, a young woman yesterday at the event Elizabeth quarterback I was coaching her at QB she was slinging the rock I was like yeah. wow I mean that th- th- that really shows how far the sport has progressed in such, such a short amount of time especially for women but you know on, on a greater scale talk about the difference between you know sports in the UK versus sports in the US the mentality maybe government backing how it's connected to schooling you know I think people are pretty interested in that concept uh, it's very very different so we have what, what we call over here, and you, you guys understand, is grassroots. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we're, we're talking football, you want to talk about everything, every everything, time. everything. So, I mean, football-wise, your kids over in the states are, are given, a, you know, put into a team from as young as eight, and it's all they know and do. And if they like it and they want to progress, all the all the tools that they need, the gym, the coaches, the understanding of the of the game, it's all just provided for them at the school level and. and you filter up that way. Mm-hmm. In the UK, if you take soccer, English football, um, if you're an eight-year-old, that's a, that's totally available to you right. in English football. So you can be an eight-year-old. You can be scouted as an eight-year-old by <sighs> by any any professional team, effectively, mm-hmm. uh, and they'll put you into their youth teams, and you'll play under 10, 11, 12, up to up to eighteen. Uh, if you're in a professional team, you then have the chance to be offered a contract. Mm-hmm. So if you've proved that you, you're good enough and you, they think they're going to give you a chance, they'll give you a professional contract. Hmm. Um, much like the NFL, the number of players that are involved until the contract arrives is, is large, and as soon as the contract arrives, it's very, very small. Of course. So um, some kids over here in the UK will be just like the college kids over in the, in the States or the high school kids in the States and all they did was football and then all of a sudden football is not there and, and it causes causes a potential problem. Mm. So um, other sports wise, yeah, uh, you have a far better organized system in terms of universities or colleges. Mm-hmm. Uh, the funding in that is astronomically better in, right. in, in the States. Um, yet at our elite level we're funded well we're coached phenomenally well you know you take the Olympics and the number of gold medals that a nation of this size churns out uh, pretty much every year Mm -hmm. is you know testament to to the level of athleticism and the coaching that's over here. So, mm, mm. so then, what what is your opinion of of you know being from England, looking at the NCAA? Obviously, it's a lot of guys' goals here in 
Europe in general to play in the NCAA. What's your opinion on players not getting paid there? Do you feel like it's it's just? Do you feel like players at the highest level, the Floridas, the Ohio State, do you feel like they should be getting paid? Or I'm just curious what your opinion is. They are getting paid. They're getting paid in a scholarship. Right. So, you know, education in the States is expensive. We were discussing that. You know, the cost of tuition over there is, you know, ten to thirty to sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, it's a crazy amount of money mm-hmm. over here in the UK. Uh, the, the fees have gone up recently, but you're still looking at um, well, now you are looking at nearly ten thousand pounds per year, so nearly ten thousand dollars. But yeah. uh, it's not always been that way. Mm-hmm. So the the guys and and girls that are on the athletic scholarships over in the states, that's that's the opportunity they're getting. What college and university should provide you with is a greater level of education, a greater level of understanding to be able to go out into the working world and uh, perform better in the working world and therefore be paid better in the working world. So the the sporting side of things is, is um, a little bit of a luxury really. Yeah. In, in one sense. So. Well, well, there's so many, it's not as black and white as people make it out to be. There's so many gray areas, okay? If you pay, if you pay football players, how do you pay the swim team? You know, how do you, how do you pay the basketball, the soccer, every sport, you just can't do it. You know, and then, but, but, but to the flip side of that, um, the, these college football programs are generating millions and millions and millions of dollars using the, the, the brand of these players who are really profiting none at all. And, and, you know, again, the education is so great. And for the right person, it 100% is worth it. But for a kid who isn't going to pay attention in class, hardly go to class, get pushed by in school just to play football, I don't think that value is necessarily there for them. So if that kid's going to do those things, not attend class you know, just be there for football, why should he be paid? Well, because that's, because football is his job. It's a full-time it's not, job. It's not his job. But it is. No, it, it could be his job. It could be. But but during college, I mean, you're putting in 40 hours a week, damn near, you know? I mean, so, so I just, I don't know. I, I think that there has to, I mean, we, we got to find it. We got to find a better way. I, I truly believe that. But what would, you know, you got a suggestion, what would you do? Well, uh, there's a new league that's about to pop up in California called the Pac-Pro League who is thinking about paying kids out of high school $50,000 as an alternative to college football. That may have some potential, it may not. Um, I can only imagine the NCAA is going to try to fight them down as much as possible, but I don't know the solution. You know, that's why I'm trying to talk to Yeah, them. no, for sure. If there was a solution, yeah. a simple solution, it would have been done. Yeah. Uh, having just come back from, from California um, and been to Berkeley, um, Go Bears, yeah. uh, as well as Stanford actually. So saw a couple of games out there and visit a high school. So have a little bit of an understanding of the the volume of um, funds and money that comes into that that sp- that sport at that mm-hmm. level. Mm-hmm. Um, should the players be played paid? It's a it's a debate, it really isn't it? It's a it? debate. It's a because debate. what are they what they're gonna do with that money? It's not. It's not really the the concern of the person that's paying them. Right. But in a long, long, you know, in the bigger picture, they've got to think uh, more than them being disposable assets to the university. Right. Which I agree. They they, they are treated like that a little yeah. bit. You yeah. look at you know, someone goes down injured, it's just next guy up. Yeah. So. It is. It is. Well. Swishing gears again as we as we get to a close. I want to get outside of football here. Cool. Uh, I want to talk about Brexit. Everyone. You know, it's a huge topic across the world. Why did the why did the UK why did England decide to leave the European Union, and and how do you feel about this decision to do so? So I voted to stay in. Okay. Uh, so that will obviously have a skew on my opinion of it. Um, why why did it happen? So there's been unrest in the UK for uh, for a number of years over the amount of perceived immigration that's coming in and the lack of job opportunities hmm. those are those are the real two big uh, issues that um, that were supposed to be addressed with with regards to brexit so the idea was to to be able to control our borders more to limit the number of people that come in and um, but whilst maintaining all the benefits that we get from being as part of the part of the European Union which predominantly 
is a, is the trade agreement. Right. So the the ability for businesses to trade uh, with European countries um, without the without rest- as many restrictions uh, under the same laws and ultimately financially it's it's better off. Right. So in the UK you've got you know these two camps those were in those are out. Um, it, was, it was a mistake entirely to call the referendum. I think it was done in in. Um, in short-sightedness to to try and show the try and show the European Union that we weren't that happy with how things are and we wanted change. Unfortunately, the government ended up with a 52 to 48 vote in getting out, mm. and the government and the prime minister at the time has resigned now. So we had to come. We we're having to come out and got to stand by it. Like we can't do a, a national referendum, <laughs> take the result and just say yeah, but it wasn't what we wanted. So like, sorry guys, we're, we're not, good. We're not we're gonna good. do it. Yeah. So, you know, we're in a real state, uh, a real mess with regards to getting ourselves out of the EU to still have a good deal. Yeah. Um, And what do you think is the, I mean, what's going to be the result? I mean, you know, you voted against it. No idea? No, nobody knows. If you listen to the news right now, they haven't got a clue what's going to happen. The the negotiations, as far as, as far as what's being reported, are bumbling along very poorly in in the UK sense. Um, and not, but nobody, literally nobody knows. And I'd say that it, like the, the English and British attitude is a bit like, well, we voted for it, see what happens, and we'll just carry on anyway. Yeah, you know, yeah. keep calm and carry on. That's you, you see that everywhere here in the UK. And yeah, we'll just whatever it is, we'll carry on. I, quite honestly, I don't. The, it could be really good. Mm. There is a flip side to obviously. I say I voted to stay in. But there is a flip side to it being really good. We produce a lot of stuff here in the UK that we just send out. Yeah. So why don't we just keep it in the UK and eat the food that we grow here mm-hmm. in the UK? You know, eat the meat that we we grow here in the UK uh, in terms of food. So you know, use the steel, use the mines, use the companies that exist here in the UK. Why why ship it all the way in from? Uh, from wherever, from Eastern Europe, you know, it's, uh, Italy, Scandinavia, wherever it comes from, and the reason is we got a better deal with them. Mm-hmm. We had a cheaper deal. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe being out will be pretty bad for a few years, but in the long run, perhaps it can work out, and we can become, uh, you know, a nation that can look after itself, and then maybe the Europeans will want to, will still want a piece of it, basically, and. And we'll be able to renegotiate something else. Well, right, and and in the in the grand scheme of things, it's it's independence. It's it's having to not rely on the European Union, the Greece, and, and, and these failing economies, and to be responsible for that here in the UK, right? I mean, that's the main premise. That was definitely you know factors over the past few years. Uh, Sp- uh, Spain, Italy, and Greece. Obviously, Greece being a real worst case example, having to be bailed out billions of pounds or euros. Um, by by the richer nations, by Germany, by the UK, um, in terms of in terms of sending our tax money and sending our, our budget over to them. So that was definitely another another large part of why we wanted to be out from a government level, mm-hmm. um, or why we wanted to renegotiate what was going on really from a government level. So yeah, we don't. <laughs> you wouldn't want to just be putting money into a pot that you don't see any benefit from. Somebody that's you know. Not living, not living, and sorting their finances out. Just can keep putting their hand in to help them out. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. And did it, did any of it also have anything to do with closing your guys' borders more? In the sense of obviously all of the the controversy with ISIS going on and the many terrorist attacks here, even in in London itself. I mean, did, was that did that play a role? Um, only to those that are you know far right thinking. Um, I if ISIS in your borders? No, that's two totally different camps sure in my opinion you know the majority of the the terrorists that have caused acts in 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 the countries that they're in are from the country that they're in right be it in the states or over here Mm -hmm. so the border issue is not an isis issue that's Mm -hmm. for sure um 
there's a as with any country where the wealth is greater than somewhere else there's an attraction for those to come over mm -hmm. um, the illegal immigration is something I think that we definitely want to clamp down on mm. uh, you know genuine immigration is is beneficial our NHS runs off immigration mm. 